This Filmmaker IQ lesson is sponsored by ICANN, award-winning designer, manufacturer, and distributor of professional video, film, and broadcast production equipment. And by Blackmagic Design, creating the world's highest quality solutions for feature film, post-production, and television broadcast industries. Hi, John Hess here from FilmmakerIQ.com and today we're going to dive into the world of color, looking at the science and the history that allows us to experience color in film. Our journey begins with the simplest of questions. What is this phenomenon called color? This question baffled people for ages, and it wasn't until 1666 when a young Isaac Newton began experimenting with optics that we came to think of color as a function of light. See, color is really our psychological reaction to a very narrow band of the electromagnetic spectrum, which we call light. From red on the low end of the spectrum through orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet at the high end. Through his experiments, Isaac Newton discovered that you could combine all the colors of light together to create white light. From his experiments, he devised the world's first color circle, using seven colors like the seven notes on a musical scale. Now, it turns out you only need three primary colors to create white or any perceivable color. This trichromatic theory was first put forward by Thomas Young and Hermann von Helmholtz in 1802. They postulated that the human retina was made of cones that were responsive to only three colors of light, red, yellow, and blue. But the Young-Helmholtz theory, though would be proven mostly correct, was based on scientific reasoning and not experimental evidence. Their theory would be refined in the 1850s by one of the greatest scientists of all time, James Clerk Maxwell. Maxwell is famous for unifying electricity, magnetism, and light into one field of study, electromagnetism. That was a branch of science that would set the stage for Albert Einstein and his theories of relativity in the 20th century. But before he did all that, Maxwell was interested in color. In his 1855 paper, Experiments on Color, Maxwell used spinning tops to demonstrate the validity of the young Helmholtz theory, refining the primary colors to red, green, and blue. And then in 1861, with the help of Thomas Sutton, the inventor of the single lens reflex camera, or SLR, Maxwell applied his theory to photography, shooting a tartan ribbon with a black and white camera three times, once using a red filter, once with a green filter, and once with a blue filter. Combining the color separations back together, Maxwell and Sutton created the world's very first permanent color photograph, which would become the basis for all color photography to come. Though Maxwell had demonstrated the principles of color photography in 1861, it would take a long time before capturing naturalistic colors could be employed in the motion picture industry. But that didn't stop early filmmakers from adding color back in after the fact. Hand tinting was a widely practiced technique of painting colors onto the film itself. During the early days of motion pictures where features lasted only 10 minutes or so, it was economically viable. In fact, Georges Méliès employed 21 women to hand tint his films frame by frame. As the demand for film became greater and greater, Charles Pathé mechanized the process of coloring film in France using a stencil process, which he called Pathé Color. By 1910, Pathé employed 400 women in his factory. Now, as film became a, an international mass media industry, even stencils could not meet the demands of production. Uh, filmmakers began using bath processes to tint and tone their films. Tinting involved putting the film in a bath of dye. This would turn the entire frame a particular color. Toning, on the other hand, only colored the dark parts of the frame by chemically converting the silver in the frame into colored silver salts. 
how some filmmakers like D.W. Griffith used tinting and toning to enhance the emotional mood of the film, but oftentimes lads would just apply colored dyes based on the scene location. Sometimes they would just apply dyes randomly. In 1920s, 80 to 90 percent of all American films were using some form of tinting or toning. But these bath processes caused some problems once sound was introduced in 1927 and printed as an optical track that ran alongside the film. A pre-tinted film stock was created to solve this problem, but it saw little use as more naturalistic ways of creating color were starting to become popular. There are two methods of creating color. The additive system is where primary colored lights are added together, and when equally mixed, they create white light. This is the process used right now as you're watching this video. Your screen is made up of tiny red, green, and blue pixels that when seen from afar, combine to create the illusion of color. The other system is the subtractive system where primary colors are subtracted from white light to create colors and when all equally and fully subtracted, create black. Both additive and subtractive color were used to create color photography. Now, the first major venture into capturing color naturally in motion pictures came in 1908 with Charles Urban and the Natural Color Kinematograph Company. The Kinemacolor system, their system, invent, was invented by George Albert Smith and was a sequential two-color additive process. In the camera, one frame would be captured with a red filter, and the very next frame would be captured with a green filter, then back and forth, red, green, red, green, red, green. When played back with a projector with a red-green filter flywheel, the red and green sequential images would add together because of our persistence of vision. The result was a surprisingly good color image, despite being only a two-color system. Kinemacolor's first big hit was the Delhi Durbar, a two-and-a-half-hour documentary on the coronation held in Delhi for the newly crowned King of England George V as the Imperial Emperor of Colonial India. But there were some major issues. Notice the registration problems in the marching soldiers' legs. Recording color sequentially meant that each frame would be slightly off, especially in fast-moving objects. And since only red and green filters were being used, there were no blue skies. Blue was impossible to reproduce. In fact, <laughs> it was this inability to create blue that would spell the downfall of Kinemacolor. Charles Urban, like any good industrialist, wanted to monopolize color film and crush all other two-color processes. Well, this created an enemy in William Freeze Green, producer of a rival red-green color system called BioColor. Freeze Green sued Urban's Kinemacolor to invalidate their patent. The first court upheld Kinemacolor's patent, but on appeal, the judge sided with Freeze Green basing his decision on the fact that Kinemacolor's patent claimed it would re reproduce natural colors, but it failed to reproduce blue, a natural color. So because of this vague wording, the technological limitation of the system spelled death. Kinemacolor's patent was revoked, and Urban's company was liquidated soon after that. But Kinemacolor proved that there was a market for color film. And other additive techniques, including chronochrome and cinechrome and British Raycall, tried to establish some followings, but additive color systems for film proved to be too technically challenging to implement. They would find use in TV and electronics. But the first truly successful color system for film would come in the form of two-strip subtractive Technicolor. The Technicolor Company was founded in 1915 to exploit a two-color additive process. Their first film was an utter failure, so they changed direction and started working on a two-color subtractive process. The new process, patented in 1922, used a beam splitter in the camera to split the light onto two black and white frames. One which is ultimately dyed red-orange, and the other which was dyed blue-green. The resulting dyed positive images would then be cemented together for a final color positive image, which could be played back in standard projectors with no special equipment. 
The first film to receive the Technicolor two-strip subtractive process was The Toll of the Sea in 1922. The Toll of the Sea grossed over $250,000. Two-strip Technicolor was an instant hit. In 1928, Technicolor refined the process with a step called imbibition, or IB, combining the color separations onto a third black gelatin-coated film, which gave Technicolor a signature rich look. As films evolved from the silent era to the sound era, musicals became a big genre and perfectly suited for Technicolor. In 1930, Technicolor was under contract for 36 major releases, but not all was perfectly rosy. Just two years later, in 1932, the production of Technicolor films had all but ended. The boom in Technicolor resulted in many cameramen who just weren't trained to achieve quality results with the process. Also, Eastman released a panchromatic film stock, which was a much more capable black and white film that produced beautiful images under normal incandescent lighting. This was much cheaper to use than the arc lights that were needed for the Technicolor 2-strip. So 2-strip was out, but Technicolor wasn't out for long. They had an ace up their sleeve. In 1932, they perfected the three-strip Technicolor system. Using a beam splitter, they captured light onto three pieces of film, green on its own strip and blue and red on a bi-packed strip. This three-strip process was technically superior to anything that had come before it, but it was really expensive. The cameras costing upwards of $30,000 a piece. And this time, Technicolor would have an iron fist over quality control. In order to make a Technicolor film, you needed a Technicolor cameraman, use a Technicolor makeup, have a Technicolor consultant make sure that your art direction had the acceptable color palette, and have the film processed and printed by, who else? Technicolor. Hollywood majors were hesitant to jump on board with this expensive process, so Technicolor offered the process to a small upstart company, Walt Disney for his Silly Symphony cartoon series. Flowers and Trees in 1932 and The Three Little Pigs in 1933 were both huge successes and even going on to win Oscars for Best Animated Short. For live action, Pioneer Films produced Technicolor's first feature film, Becky Sharp, which had a great buzz about it, but was ultimately a failure. David O. Selznick's independent studio produced the first commercially successful Technicolor feature with The Garden of Allah in 1936. But to me, the showcase of Technicolor's brilliance would come from Warner Brothers with The Adventures of Robin Hood in 1938, which won three Academy Awards for its aesthetic use of color. <laughs> If I could only reach him. Stand back! Stand back! And then came 1939, considered the greatest year in the golden era of studio-controlled Hollywood. 1939 was also a great year for Technicolor. The Wizard of Oz demonstrated the incredible richness of Technicolor in creating this magical land of Oz but it was gone with the wind that first put to use the company's new fast, fine grain film stock, a major technological breakthrough that reduced the light required by 50%. In 1941, Technicolor introduced the mono pack, combining the three separations into a single roll of film that could be loaded in conventional cameras, a great thing for location shooting. So Technicolor had come back with a vengeance after the failure of the two strip and now was on top of their game, doing what Charles Urban could only hope to do with Kinemacolor, hold a virtual monopoly over color film production. Technicolor and its supplier Eastman Kodak control 90% of the color film market. The United States Justice Department saw this as a problem and filed an antitrust civil suit in 1947. 
In 1950, a court decree forced Technicolor to make available a certain number of cameras to small independent companies on a first-come, first-served basis. But this government interaction didn't really do much to quell Technicolor's power. What would really break the monopoly was a new kind of cheaper film stock, Eastman Color. Eastman Color was based on the German Agfa Color process developed in 1936. Similar to Technicolor Monopack that sandwiched three film separations into a single roll, Agfa Color was the crown jewel of the Nazi propaganda machine. Now, after the end of World War II, the patents were released and the process was adopted all over the world, becoming Sov Color in the USSR and Fuji Color in Japan. But it was Eastman's refinement of Agfa color that really made it popular. Using automatic color masking and released in 1950, Eastman color was relatively cheap. It didn't require specialized lights or lab processing and would work in conventional motion picture film cameras. It didn't deliver the same rich color as the technologically superior Technicolor, but audiences' tastes were already shifting away from that Technicolor look. Eastman color would go on to win a Technical Academy Award in 1952, practically putting to rest the three-strip Technicolor process, which would cease to be used within two short years. Eastman Color film stock has come to be known by the names of the studios and labs that licensed it, such as Warner Color, Metro Color, Deluxe, and Movie Lab. Though the richness of Technicolor had started the move of film toward color, it was the ease and cost effectiveness of Eastman Color that sustained the growth of color so that by 1967, virtually all major features were being shot in color. Even Technicolor ultimately switched over to the Eastman Color process in 1975, selling off their imbibition dye process to the Chinese government. There was just one major problem with Eastman Color film, and it would not rear its ugly head for at least a decade. Eastman Color was not very stable, and it tended to fade much faster than other processes, as quickly as five years if not stored properly. This would be a major issue in film preservation. In 1980, Martin Scorsese led a campaign to push Eastman to develop a low-fade archival film, which they did, but a lot of films were already starting to disappear. The race against time for film preservation had begun. Advancements to the color of films can come from all sorts of bizarre places. In 1985, media mogul Ted Turner set out to colorize a catalog of studio-era black-and-white titles that he had acquired during his brief ownership of MGM UA. Using digital manipulation, the films were scanned and colored frame by frame in sort of an electronic version of George Meyers' hand-tinting shops. The colorization of old black and white films was a controversial move, to say the least, with Turner himself half-jokingly stating that he would not stop until he colorized Citizen Kane. Well, just three weeks before he died, Orson Welles, who had a clause in his contract saying that Kane could not be edited without his permission, told a friend, quote, don't let Ted Turner deface my movie with his crayons. Citizen Kane was spared. But Turner's colorization got filmmakers thinking about the possibilities of selective color manipulation. In the 90s, many filmmakers started to explore different lab processes, such as bleach bypass, to create unique film tones. Moving into the 2000s, computers had become powerful enough to handle entire films. Digital intermediaries came into use, a process of scanning a film frame by frame into a computer to be digitally manipulated. The first film to get the digital intermediary treatment was the Coen Brothers with Oh Brother, Where Art Thou in 2000. Cinematographer Roger Deakins worked for 11 weeks toning down the lush green summer foliage to create a dusty, golden, desaturated look. As our filmmaking post-production tools continue to move into the digital realm, the creative possibilities for color manipulations are endless. 
But perhaps just as important, our modern digital tools give us some weapons in the fight for film preservation. And we have a much better capability to restore the fading prints of film's past, preserving our cultural heritage for future generations. But now the question will be, how do we store those digital assets for the long term? From the moment when Dorothy first opens the door onto that beautiful technicolor world of Oz, it's clear that the use of color can move us and transport us. Color is a subtle tool that can unlock a world that can be as normal, idealized, gritty, or fantastically different as we want it to be. So use that tool, use color. Go and make something great. I'm John Hess and I'll see you at filmmakeriq.com.